Good, e good evening, everyone. I'm David Miller from the Rhinebeck Historical Society, and this is our monthly program in the local history room. And tonight we're very excited to have John Lebotsky here. Um, John, John and his family own Wonderland Forest, Florist, and they've been uh, farmers in Rhinebeck for many generations. And uh, we're very excited to hear what John has to say about the history of farming in Rhinebeck. So that's my introduction. John? Okay, yeah. my name is John Lebowski, and uh, welcome everybody. Um, any farmers here or would-be farmers? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Let's get All right, first, uh, before I start on my little speech here, I don't know if you people purple heard about that terrible accident up on 308 the other day. I've got to tell you about it. Uh, I think it was Trent Saltzman, uh, he hit the Easter Bunny. <laughs> he killed it. He just laid out there like a waffle with, with a fur coat on. <laughs> he got out of his vehicle and he was really upset. He said, well, i got to go hide the eggs now. The kids won't have any eggs to find. <laughs> then he's got to skip the White House lawn. <laughs> Anyhow, a red convertible comes up and this beautiful blonde naturally gets out of the convertible. I said, can I help you? She, he said, yeah, I ran over the Easter Bunny. I said, well, I think I can help you. I'll go back to my car and she comes out with an aerosol can and she sprays the bunny and the bunny uh, gets back to shape. He hops up and he waves at him and hops along and waves back and he said, wow, what was in that can? Well, it's hairspray <laughs> and it says right on it, it brings dead hair to life and it's put on the <laughs> Okay. The farm, my father came from Russia in 1910. He was in Russia at that time and he saw the unrest going on and he knew he had to get out of the country. That was before the Bolshevik Revolution. So that happened around 1918. In 1910, him and his cousin snuck out of Russia in a, he said, a vegetable wagon and got into Poland, crossed Poland, came into Germany, and they got on a freighter going to Brazil. That was, they had a homestead act in Brazil. They were going to give out free land if you farmed it for so many years, and they thought it was a good deal. So the, the freighter stopped in New York City, and they got off to see the city. Well, I guess they saw too many sites because they missed the boat to Brazil. Otherwise, I'd be, I'd be speaking Portuguese, I guess. <laughs> so they stayed. He worked in a sweat factory for a while. Then he went out on Long Island, worked on some big farms around Riverhead. Then he moved to North Jersey, where he met his my uh, mother. And in 1920, they bought the farm here on White Schoolhouse Road, and they moved up here. The farm was in pretty rough shape, and that's where he, that's what he named the farm because he said it's wonder anything grew in this land, so he called it Wonderland. <laughs> so, anyhow, they had to start. They had to make a living. They had to do something. So he started with some easy crops like chickens and, and pigs, which grew fast, started a dairy with a few cows, but they took in boarders. That was going to be their income from the city. That was pretty popular back then. People would come up with their family, two or three kids, and they would stay, they would stay maybe a month. The husband would go back to the city like Sunday night and come back Friday night, and uh, they usually with a couple of kids and the mother, and they would sort of help with the whole deal anyhow, because my mother had to cook as many as 20 boarders we had. Mm -hmm. And uh, we didn't have any place to sleep, us kids. We just slept in the hay barn, but I loved it. You know, that was good. <laughs> so uh, the border thing worked out pretty good while he was uh, starting up his farm. And some of these people are still come up today, they're still friends of the family. Hmm. So, uh, well, let's, let's go into what, something else here. Well, he started it, but family. He raised, he started raising flowers. We raised asters, delphiniums, gladiolas, and we shipped them to New York. Uh, some were shipped on the Hucklebush, 
I don't know how many remember the Huckabush Railroad and some on New York Central, I guess it was called that back then. But the Hucklebush was quite a, uh, that's a whole other story if you ever get into talking about the Hucklebush. That train went through Hog Bridge, there was four coal yards there, freight, and it would service all the area going up through Pine Plain all the way to Hartford. We made, and uh, the, the first year the Astros grew good. The second year, they got some kind of disease on them, so you had to raise them under ten. We raised them on a cheesecloth tent, the same as the tobacco growers grow in Connecticut Valley. And we bought the cheesecloth, as I remember, from the tobacco growers. And we had as much as two acres under tent. And they come along real nice. And we got hit with a hurricane. They didn't name them back there. It was called the Long Island Express. <laughs> Anybody remember that one? 1938. It took that tent right down. That was the end of our after operation. That was probably the worst hurricane that I can remember. The White Schoolhouse Road was underwater. It never would have to be after that. That was a big hurricane. So, so anyhow, they started planting asparagus. We ended up with 13 acres of asparagus. I cut asparagus before I went to school. When I got out of school, I was still cutting. The stuff never stopped growing. <laughs> but we sold it all local. We sold it up in as much as we could. We had quite a trade of people just running out there. And I can remember, the, there were two and a half pound bunches that we bunched up. We sold them for 30 cents for the skinniest, the mediums were 40 cents, and the jumbo stalks were 50 cents a bunch. That's two and a half pounds. To get labor, we would advertise in the high school, laborers wanted 50 cents an hour, we were flooded with kids. All kind of help came in. They said, how can you pay so much money, 50 cents an hour? I even had two school teachers, I remember, <laughs> working there. So if you tried that today, it wouldn't work. I don't even, <laughs> even, even if it was $10 an hour, I don't think you'd get them. Things have changed since then. Uh, other labor came from uh, uh, an agriculture school on Long Island. Part of their curriculum was uh, they had to work for a month on a, f a working farm. We used to get two or three from there, and they had to write every day what they did on the farm. And, and uh, then, then we hit into the 30s, the Depression era. Uh, and uh, that was Depression. We, got, we had four relatives. They couldn't find any work. The standard wage during the 30s was a dollar an hour in board. Uh, I mean, dollar a day, dollar a day. That, that was terrible. I remember seeing hobos coming almost every day. My mother would always feed them. These were people that didn't have homes. and they, We talk about tough times, but we'll never see those kind of times again, I hope. So, uh, and then we, had, we got uh, men from the Wasek State School. They would leave them out for 60 days, and if they could make it 90 days, they released them. We had a lot of them get released from our farm, and a lot of them were shipped back, especially the ones that carried the axe on their shoulder and went around laughing. You know, we didn't keep them too long. <laughs> but many of you probably remember Freddie, and he was with us our, his whole life, and he was, a, was from Wasik, and he was a good, good worker and a good guy. Uh, I think he was with us more than 40 years. So, and, uh, now let's get into harvesting some things. You know, we, we, we started, I don't know if you people know how a barn is laid out, the dust barns, but in the center there's a hole, big hole there, where you can bring down a hay fork. The hay fork would look like this, and had, and when you cocked it, it had two, two little things turned in. You, you jam that into the loose hay, and you cock it, grab the hay like this, then it goes up a pulley all the way to the top of the rafter, and by which way you pulled it, it was pulled with a rope and a team of horses, it would go to one side of the barn or the other, and you had a trip rope. And you would just get back, and the guy would yeah, trip it, and you'd trip it, and that's why the hay got into the barns. Uh, we pitched, we didn't have a baler, we pitched all the hay on by hand for years, and, uh, and the, great, the small grains, I just sort of remember 
the beginning, we, we, had, we ended up with a reaper binder, but in the beginning we used, I can remember the guys harvesting grain with a cradle and a sigh. Now, anybody know what that is? It, uh, a sigh is a big blade with a handle you cut like this. And the back of the sigh was like your fingers, they're about four, four, three foot long, uh, light sticks. And then when you cut the grain, it fell against this cradle. And the, and the fellow who worked the, the, the sigh would either dump it in a pile. It was a nice pile. It stayed nice and easy. And somebody behind him would take a few grain, maybe 10, 12 stalks, wrap it around, hit a knot, and tuck both ends in, and left the bundle, and then he had a, a shocking crew behind that, standing the grain up. He, he stuck two together, he put two, maybe five, six, seven, according to how big they were, a couple on the top. And if they're going to stay out there a while, you open one up that, with the top down that acted as a watershed. Sometimes you could keep that there for a month or two, or we usually let it dry for about a week. And then you had to pick this grain up on a wagon, bring it to a threshing machine. Now, Ralph Haver was a man, a local man that had all this big equipment. And I have a picture of it over here when I passed him out. And he had to bring the grain to the threshing machine and feed it through a hole that took it and it beat it all up. and. And it kicked, the straw went one way, and the grain went in bags. And then when it was all finished, he come with his big baler, stationary baler, and he threw the straw in it, and uh, it bailed it up. Now before this really happened with the threshing machine, and they cut the grain with the cradle, they also threshed it with a flail. And the flail, everybody know what a flail is? It's a stick about, uh, I'd say five foot long, maybe an inch and a half. And on the top was a piece of leather and another shorter stick. And, and uh, you could whack it like this short stick would whack the grain, and you'd have it on a, on a floor that was good, maybe, you know, not as good as this table, but not. And then after that, you would winnow the grain. It had all the chafe in it, and you would. You would Stand as high as you can, spill it slow, and a windy day it'll blow all the right. chase right out of it. And, uh, and then uh, maybe twice he would do that. And if he wanted to make flour out of it, which we did, he would do more cleaning than that. But uh, that was uh, then the reaper came first before the reaper binder. The reaper just cut the grain, and then you had to still tie it. It was still complicated, but we had a reaper binder. They cut the grain and, and the, it made the bundles, but you still had to go and stack them up. I didn't realize that Reaper was invented, I guess, back in the early 1800s, because I read about it in, in England. They, they had a big revolt over it. In 1830, they had a revolt in England over the Reaper. It was putting so many people out of work. They had a riot. They were, a lot of them were arrested, and hundreds of them went. The British government did was ship them to Australia, and that's how Australia got settled. When people that were losing their jobs to the Reaper, so there's quite a history that that piece of machinery. Now Ralph Haver, who did all this, he also had a buzz saw, and he'd come around and cut your firewood up for you, and he's, he had all kinds of heavy equipment that most farmers didn't have, so he was a handy man to have around. Now I did a lot of plowing myself with horses, and we had a team of horses. And uh, Harold Brown, mostly, mostly with the spring tooth Harold. And uh, the horses were used, we had a, one tractor, an old fortune that was steel wheeled and no rubber tires on it and hard tractor to work with. But we used the horses more than the tractor. My father said he had to feed the horses anyhow, so why buy gasoline? <laughs> so we used the horses. Uh, but they worked out all right. They, uh, they did a lot of work on the things. We, they had a mowing machine for them, a dump rake, and then we pitched the hay on by hand. Uh, food. You had to can food and you had to preserve food for the winter. That was one of the main things the small farms had to do. We didn't have any electricity in the early 30s. We didn't get electricity until FDR started rural electrification. So. There was no inside plumbing. There was no uh, 
no radios or anything like that. Everything was heated with wood, and you had to preserve food. And also, we had an outhouse. Of course, it was a two-seater. I don't know why, but it was a two-seater. <laughs> and that was about 100 yards away from the house. You didn't linger it too long in the winter. But uh, when electricity did come, the first thing we did was make indoor plumbing and uh, brought water in. And uh, that was really a godsend. Before then, we kept the food from spoiling in the spring. It was a couple hundred yards from the house. And we put it in a waterproof can, like the butter and the eggs and stuff like that. And we would submerge it in the spring, which was ever flowing and pretty cold, and would keep the food pretty good. So my, my mother canned hundreds of jars in a pressure pot for food for the winter. Tomatoes, a whole cow we would butcher. And all the meat of the cow, I mean, every cut of it went in the cans. Everything tastes the same, whether it's steak or back, you know. <laughs> oh, boy. But it was, you know, and we had a root cellar. I had to keep the stuff that way. And, and my father, my father smoked the pigs. I remember butchering the pigs and the, and the cattle and the chickens. I don't want to tell you how we did the chickens for Sunday dinner, but I hope not too many of you did the same way. We actually chopped the heads off with a hatchet when you had to get chickens for dinner. I guess that would be kind of cruel. And cows, God, we hand milked them things. Bad on your hands, bad on the cows. Uh, I think today it would probably be called sexual harassment, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but, but for years we, uh, we milked them by hand. And, uh, there was a factory, a canning factory in Poughkeepsie before IBM plant was made. <laughs> and we took a lot of vegetables down to there and they canned it. And uh, I don't know if anybody remember that factory. But uh, when was IBM made, anyhow? Was, uh, anybody know when it was built? When did IBM It was before the war. Yeah. Yeah. Before the war? Well, yeah. Not too much, though. So. Right? Yeah, because they were doing, they were making uh, rifles and stuff for the yeah. war. Oh, yeah. That factory canned a lot of stuff. I can remember that they did fruit from all around the world, and they did vegetables, and, and uh, we would take beans out there, they would just dump them down the chute, and they got canned up. Was that down by the river, John? Yeah, yeah. What was known as the pickle factory at one time? Maybe? Yeah, it was pickles there, too, and, <laughs> and it's, uh, it was quite, a, quite an operation. Uh, well, when a... We also had a water to get the plumbing into the cow barns and stuff so the cows could drink water automatically when we, made, we laid a lot of pipes on the ground. And, uh, so, so it made life a little easier when electricity came. So we, uh, after the factory closed, I started selling vegetables and stuff through Poughkeepsie. On every corner had a little store, a little, uh, maybe just like the Rhinebeck Deli. They sold little vegetables and, and through things that one bag of corn, one basket of tomatoes. I got I about that 50 stores, almost every block had a store. And that's how we sold what we were uh, raising. And then after that, I moved up to the Grand Union stores and at one time I served 13 Grand Union stores and five a &Ps every day. And that was quite a route. We would pick the corn the same day and deliver it to them. And even today, I don't know how we ever did it. But I started, we would start picking corn actually with the headlights of our truck. And the first load would be out by 9 o'clock uh, with 100 bags on it. And the second load would follow it. And, uh, crazy, uh, from dark to dark. And then after the Grand Union went out of business, we served five shop rights, who took just as much as the 13 stores and the five A&Ps together. It made it a little easier. They only had five stops. But then the shop rights, when they disappeared, we stopped doing that. They, today, what we raise, what we don't sell on the farm market, I sell to Omega Institute and to the Culinary, and a little bit to Adams, whenever I get a surplus. They've been pretty good with me, Adams. I've known those boys since they, before they had to stand. 
and I'll call up Ralph and say, hey, I got a surplus. He said, don't even call, just bring whatever you have. <laughs> so over the years, it's been very good. I understand he doesn't come into the store anymore. He's home. Uh, he's about four, three or four years older than I am, so he's about 90 years old. I'm 87. So you got any questions out there? No. How, how many farms were on White Schoolhouse Road? There was four. There was Dr. Clover, where Ron Ellis lived. Right. The Bailey Farm, which was right opposite you. Yeah. That was Sora, that Sora bought. Yes. Did she buy it from? From Bailey. Mm -hmm. From Bailey. Okay. Bailey was there first. And what was, what was, were they They raised cows. Rice? They had cows. They had cows? Yes. Yeah. And they, and they actually followed us and planted a little bit of asparagus, too. So. Well, they had grapes behind us. Yes, they had some grapes back in there, too, yeah. And then our farm, and then there was Dr. Clover, where the Morans lived. Okay. Mike Moran and Gus Moran. Yeah, yep. yeah. And down down below that was uh, the Everett, was a colored fellow had a farm. And he just raised, like, chickens and stuff like that. And, and, uh, that was the four farms on there. Mm -hmm. And uh, the milk that we had would be picked up in a 40, I guess there were 40 quart cans, of big metal cans. And actually, Richie Bonnelly would pick it up. He was driving a milk truck then. Uh, and every morning he'd come and pick them up and take them to, oh, I don't know, down to Poughkeepsie, I guess, Fitch or some other okay. places like that. But that was, uh, uh, and when they stopped doing it, Roland Sharp had a, where the Fells auction is now, had a platform where everybody took the milk to, and they would pick all the milk up from a standard place. The Fogels also had the milk. Who's that? Fogel. Vogel. Vogel, yes. Yeah. Yes. Uh, yeah. They had a big... Well, Hermie milk. Flax was out by, just before Vogel, and he had a retail route of milk. Yeah. And Hermie also built some houses out there in, in Amyville. And Amyville had a blacksmith shop. Those blacksmith shops were really something else. Any part that we needed, like the A.B. Gaze and the Jano, would anybody remember that yeah. blacksmith shop? Yeah. Uh, well, they would make parts for us, and, and it was just amazing to watch them work with metal. And, uh, sort of miss that now. They could make almost any part that was broken. Uh, you had to fend for yourself. You had to make, and the, the farmers would, when they harvest stuff, you join together, you know, and you had to maybe fill a silo or something like that. Four or five farmers would fill his and the other one would fill. And it was more camaraderie, like, I don't know, it was more, more friendly. I filled a lot of silos. <laughs> I usually ran the machinery because some of the people, even the old farmers, didn't know how to put the belts on the pulleys and stuff like that. So I, I was usually running the operation of the blower. But, uh, Things have changed now. All the farms are big now. And, but I think we have a trend towards little organic farms now starting. And that's good to see. Uh, there must be more questions out here, right? Yeah. Um, you said that you started out your family growing flowers. So did the Depression cause you to move to growing more food because more people were hungry? or? Well. We had no problem selling the food that we raised. You know, we had a lot of a lot of people coming right to the farm. We had quite a road stand right by the farm. The people would come up there. I got, I can remember. It was busier almost than the, than the store we have now in town. I remember one weekend we sold forty, and I don't raise peaches. I sold forty bushels of peaches mm -hmm. just on one weekend. Just so people, everyone bought what things by the bushel. A bag of corn, a bushel of uh, peaches, a bushel of tomatoes. Tony Salerno would send his men and take a whole load every weekend. Everybody knows Tony Salerno? <laughs> he was a good customer. He was our local mafia man. <laughs> Any other questions? John, how many acres do you have today and what, what crops are you growing? Well, we have, uh, right now, we started with a 160-acre farm, that was the original farm, and then I bought another 160 acres. And then we rented the Moran farm in between, which had like 120 acres. We still run that farm. With the original farm, 
most of the original farm is now Deckard's gravel pit. And uh, my son still raises, cut your own Christmas trees and pick your own pumpkins. And I have a, a small garden that I run by myself. I have a hoop house that's uh, 80 by 20. And I've had tomatoes in it now for three years. I'm going to go to fourth year because I, they're all grafted. You're not supposed to raise tomatoes in the same ground after two or three years. They usually die from disease or something. They're grafted onto a root stock that's resistant to disease. It's very, very beneficial. I understand in Europe, <coughs> uh, almost every farmer grafts tomatoes. They don't plant tomatoes without grafting them. And, uh, it doesn't stop the, the blights from coming, but it stops all the root diseases, the nematodes and things like that with the resistant yeah. roots. And they have more vigor. They grow much more vigor. And I like grafting the plants because I've played with plants that way since I've been in high school, grafting and grafting apple trees and peach trees and making cuttings and, and things like that. But any any questions on the old time farming there yet? There must be something there. I, John, do you remember any sheep farms when you were a young young guy? Sheep, sheep farms in the area. So my mother remembers sheep drives down Route 308. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're, they're up towards Rock City and, and Ben Collins and up that area, they had uh, remember Ben's farm there. Yeah, I do. Yeah, there was a lot of farms around then, and uh, Mike Proper and oh God. And, uh, do you remember Ed Lewis? Oh sure, well, Ed he Lewis. He had cows. Yeah, yeah. Ed, Ed's a new type farmer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but uh, Mike Proper was there before, and I don't know what. He's famous for his car. He used to go down to the one of the local watering holes and tie one on, and that car took him home just like a. Didn't have to drive it. I don't know how he ever did it. <laughs> just went home. But, uh, and he used to roll and sell cigarettes too. Oh yeah, we actually split wood matches in the depression area, so we didn't have to use the whole match to light a fire. And I remember rolling cigarettes for my father with the paper and with the tobacco and. Stuff like that, but uh, and, and everything on a pig was used for the blood to make blood sausages. Uh, every organ I didn't like organs out of pigs, but I, we had to eat every one of them. And even out of a cow, the tripe and the stomach and the oh man, <laughs> <laughs> but nothing went to waste. But he, my father made a head cheese that I still can remember how good that tastes. Well, you can't buy it like that from the hooves and the head and, uh, of the pig and he boiled it up, but uh, he, made, he knew how to make it. There was some good food back then. My mother really could cook on a wood stove. It was just amazing. And it didn't have any thermometer on it and she could just cook stuff and everything came out perfect. And it was, uh, we would burn about 15 cords of wood in a year and we could cut that up with a bud saw in probably two days. You know, we. Ended up using our own bud saw, but for years we used Ralph Haver. He would come and we cut the thing up. Ralph, I don't know, he, he did have a few fingers left, but most of them were cut off on the bud saw. <laughs> John, was, was there any tobacco growing in Dutchess County, or was that over the border in the Connecticut Valley? Well, it was mostly in the Connecticut Valley, but we did, uh, my father always was raising new stuff. He was quite innovative in we raised a field of ergot. Anybody know what ergot is? As it's used for blood thinning, uh, blood coagulating. It's still being used. So he had the idea, it's a, it's a fungus that grows on the rye head. Maybe one or two kernels of a big black. If you looked on the Google, I'm sure you'll find it. And so he got a hold of some professor up in, uh, I think it was in Syracuse. And they, they worked together and he, and he got a, I don't know, inoculation type stuff that he sent to us. And I went through the field spraying with a hand sprayer to infect the rye field. And it infected it. Boy, I had ergot, black kernels hanging all over the place. My father thought he had it made. Oh, this is something. We went to harvest it. Every one you broke open had a worm in it. It was an ergot worm. <laughs> Unreal. I can't believe where that thing came from. 
Well, if you were racing rye, were you? Was there a still anywhere near? Well, there was a still all over the place. Yeah. <laughs> Uncle Nate and a bunch of Ben Collins had one, and during the depression, uh, then had, had, had one. And, uh, boy, oh boy. <laughs> yeah. What's your biggest harvest now? What's that? What's your biggest harvest now? What product? We have, well, pumpkins. Pumpkins? Probably are. Yeah, but well, you have to pick your own. And, and we had like 14 acres of pumpkins. Oh, pumpkins. You were growing corn too for a while. Oh, yeah. yeah. After I what do, you, after do you have a stand for this? What's that? Do you have a farm stand for this? Yeah, Wonderland. Right here on 308. Oh, on 308. Yeah, You're the first place just out of Rhinebeck. Yeah, we sell right. it. We sell it there. But I sell. I sell to a lot of other stores too. Like we supply at Montgomery Place. We supply Adams. Right. We supply quite a few stands. And, uh, right. and a lot of a lot of chain stores too. Right. I want to ask you another question. The fairgrounds is owned by Agriculture Society. Yeah. Did they help the farmers up here? Well, I'm just curious though. They. Uh, I imagine, I don't know what way you mean help them, though. Well, it's, all, it's supposed to be non-profit. Yeah. And, you know, they, they do take in quite a bit of funds. I was curious. They always run that out of loss. What are you talking about? Huh? <laughs> <laughs> I was just curious. I was just curious. It's the Agriculture Society. Did they help the farmers uh, well, in, no, they, in New York State? I think they help. With their, they, help? They, they improve their buildings, and they make... The grounds look better, but I don't think they help any farmers. They don't help the farmers, though. But it's a society, though, but I understand it. Yeah. John, there's a Cornell Cooperative Extension down in Millbrook. Yeah. Do they, do they supply information from... Well, for a couple of years, I was working with them on raising mushrooms, and we were trying to get a, 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 mushrooms to give to more of the farmers around the county so they have another crop to sell. And uh, actually, when they cut the budget, the man I was working with lost his job, we, and the project wasn't kaput. But well, we were for two years we were raising shiitakes and an oyster and uh, portobellos, and they're coming along pretty good with the system. And it's too bad it went out, but they cut the budget on the guy, and that was it. But then the, that's the trouble with trying to raise money for that that place out there. You know, they do have some programs, but not like it used to be. Their, their <coughs> budget's cut too much. But it's, it's actually two things. There's also the, the government's there too. You know, not only just a cooperative extension, it's a, where they, they pay farmers not to raise things. You know, that always gets me. <laughs> but I guess it still goes on. It doesn't make sense. You want to cut the budget? Well, you sure can cut it there. Because there's actually some farmers, so-called farmers that I know in the area, that are collecting but not raising stuff, and that that shouldn't be in my mind, anyhow. Especially when food is scarce like this and stuff. Yeah. Is there a county agent or is that what the Cornell Cooperative that's what they, is? That's what they got rid of. That's what they got rid of. The yeah, agent. I was working with him and we were coming along pretty good with the, with the mushrooms. He was very interested in getting it going. And I inoculated some logs even by the, by the shop there. For two years I fixed the talkies. Uh, it could be a good project. Uh, maybe someday they'll revive it. Right now, I might go out there and, and do some demonstrating on grafting tomatoes, and so when they they have different classes out there. I'd like to do that. Now, you had a question back there. Are you really interested in hydroponics? Have you ever experimented with that? Well, no. I know there's a good hydroponic farm over in Highland. It really is big scale. I've been over there. But that's an entirely different thing to hydroponics. It raises a good crop, but I don't think they taste the same as in the ground. Oh, really? Yeah. Also, if you talk about fruit and how they taste, I think the old varieties, before they become hybrid, taste better than the hybrids today. The hybrids produce more, but they sure don't taste even like cucumbers and stuff. The old market more tasted much better than a burpee hybrid with the, they puff up so big and they don't say like they used to. And, like a, and even the tomatoes, tomatoes tomato don't. Tomatoes now are raised for shelf life and hardness, and they don't spoil. They don't taste like the old varieties that we had. Even Rutgers and, and some of those other varieties that were, were tasted much better. I have a question. 
Yeah, go ahead. All right. <laughs> do you need a lot of fencing to protect your crops or not? We do fence, so we had my, my son put a fence around the pumpkin field, and it's always a problem trying to keep the deer out. Yeah. You know, deer just showed up here. They weren't always here. When we first started farming, and my father saw the first deer track, he thought it was a sheep that got loose. There wasn't any deer. <laughs> we didn't have any damage, but we had damage with woodchucks. Now you don't see any woodchucks in the hay fields, but the coyotes take care of them. Any woodchuck you see is near buildings. They had enough sense to move away from the fields. But the, the horses used to fall down a woodchuck hole, thought they'd break a leg and something like that. But there's no more woodchucks in open fields here. Uh, there's, there's things have changed. I have a coyote coming Sorry. through my property, and he goes towards the Vanderlees where they have a duck. Oh, yeah, they like dark ducks. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> They're on three uh, on White Schoolhouse Road also. Yeah. But, he, but the, the whole flora and fauna has changed over the years. I've seen it. Mm -hmm. You know, we have a lot of coyotes now. We have bobcats. I have a couple families of fisher at my place. I've seen them a couple times. Mm -hmm. Otter. But we always had otters and, and mushrats. But the bobcats and the fisher is really new. And the coyotes, I remember when there was no coyotes and then they started. And there used to be a fellow by the name of Bob Wolford. Anybody remember Bob Wolford? Yeah. He called me up one day. He said, there's a monkey in my barn. <laughs> <laughs> so I went over there and it was the first possum I saw. He was sitting up there grinning. You know, he thought it was a monkey. <laughs> so that, then, the, then the possum came and looked around here. Well, he drank a little bit too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, I had a question back here. Yeah, uh, getting back to organizations, was your uh, family involved with the Grange and what was that like? The Grange? The Grange. Yeah. What yes. was that like? Yeah. Well, the Grange in Rhymeck at one time was quite active. It was quite active. Yes. I don't know that any Grange is active anymore, is there? I don't know. But that was a, that was a good organization. And then they had a meeting that, well, they had a building even, the Grange Hall, yeah, where the lawyers right. lived down in Rhymeck. Right. <coughs> and they had a bunch of meetings, but things have changed, you know. Uh, more or less, Rhymeck one is dead. What would you do for fun and recreation when you had the little time that you had? Uh, I did a lot of fishing and uh, played in the stream. I had pet ducks, fuzzy and wuzzy. <laughs> <laughs> And my brother had Snowball, and uh, they were both Drakes, and uh, Fuzzy would beat Snowball up every time. But uh, one day Snowball turned the table, and boy, was my brother happy. Boy. <laughs> now, we, we plucked the geese dry, because my mother made pickles out of them. You know, the down didn't want to dunk them in hot water, and we would pluck them very carefully, and the down part off. And, and uh, she would remove the inner part and made beautiful pillows out of the thing. But that's, there was a lot of hand work then. Did you have a trap line Did used to use bean yeah. bags to make the quilts? Because my mother grew up on a chicken farm and I still had like a bag with pink and white stripes on it that was feed bags. And she said that the families used to take them and sew them into quilts. Oh, oh yeah. Dresses yeah. From the, uh, yeah bags. My, my sister used to make you know, dresses out of them. Skirts, yeah. feed bags. Yeah. So, yeah, I don't know if I mentioned this, but flailing the grain, you know, I loved, loved to whack that thing. And, uh, mainly because uh, I may believe that was my older sister who always got <laughs> teasing me. Any other questions, Becky? Did you just have one brother, or were there One brother, and he passed away. Yeah. Yeah, he, he fought in the Korean War, and then he worked in a nursery down in Rosedale, and, and he would come up to the farm quite a, quite a bit. He, he had two children, and and one just bought a farm down by Salt Point, and she's got have horses and stuff on it. I haven't been down there to visit it, and the other one's down in South Carolina. And, uh, and my older sister's dad, but my younger sister, my my my. my not my younger sister, but she's two years older than I am. She's still alive. She's down in Silver Springs, 
And if you went on Google and look, look up Julia Lavoska, and you'll see all the things she accomplished. She had done quite a bit in, in medical research. Yeah. All right. Any more questions for John? Yeah. Just a little wrap up. Where, where do you see farming going from here in the future, 10, 20 years? Well, I. If there wasn't the ag district right now, I think a lot of farms would disappear. The taxes are just killing everything, the cost of doing things, and the labor costs. And the, now, uh, we went through a whole era like, in the beginning there weren't hardly any bugs and nobody sprayed it. You didn't really care if you had a worm in the apple, you just cut around it and still used the apple. But then they all, everybody wanted things perfect and they start using chemicals. And uh, I'm trying to get away, now in my greenhouses down there, I have four greenhouses. I haven't put an insecticide in there in years. I, we released ladybugs and some other insects to kill, like uh, aphids and different kind of things like that. And it works great. Because when you spray your fields with insecticide, you're killing the good bugs too, the praying mantis and the other things. And we find we can control them pretty good by releasing, you can buy ladybugs. We buy ladybugs, I understand, in the winter, there's mountains of them out in the uh, California desert. And people go out there and scout for them, and they find out one of these mountains, they protect it. They sit right there. They're worth thousands of dollars because they bag them up and they sell them. And they're big in this room, the mountain of ladybugs. And uh, we buy them, we keep them in the, in the core, and as we need them, we release a court in the greenhouses, and they do a great job. So there's different ways to control insects and things like that. Yeah. John, any? Any idea of how many active farms there are in the immediate area now? Oh boy, there's a lot of little ones starting up, you know? There's a little organic things and stuff, which is good to see. And, uh, I don't know how organic they are because to me there's no such thing as a true organic, I, no matter what you say. <laughs> because uh, the, the mackerel is a good friend of mine. He says, well, he picks up leaves and Millerton, you know, for his garden. I said, well, don't the people put insecticide on the lawns where you pick the leaves in the air? Don't think the trees... So it's not really... There isn't anything you can get and say it's really organic. You get horse manure or cow manure, what do they eat? Do you eat anything that, with the chemicals in it? It passes through, so... A true organic is, I think, impossible. But you can be as... Use as little insecticide and fungicide as you can. There's a lot of cures and crops without using, like I use baking soda and milk to control mildew. It works great. Mm -hmm. You don't have to buy a chemical to control mildew. I'm not, like late, your know, summer squash here, zucchini late in the year gets mildew or cucumbers, just stops it. And uh, timing, you time sweet corn between May 15th and May 30th, you skip the first brood of corn earworms and you, and you miss the second one. You got worm free corn. You watch when the dragonflies start coming out, and another that's when the first corn borers start flying. I mean, all these things go with nature that you learn over the years that you can plant at the right time and miss, you know, getting infected with things. Okay. Yeah. Do you ever have beehives on the farm? Beehives? Mm -hmm. We uh, we have sometimes beekeepers bring them in. But we never raised beehives. Okay. But uh, we, we did when my father was there, and, and uh, I can remember him sticking his arm in a beehive to get stung purposely mm -hmm. yeah, to cure rheumatism. Mm -hmm. And it was like 50, 100 bees would bite him on the arm, and his rheumatism went away. But the pain was all here. <laughs> <laughs> Did your father come from generations of farming himself, or...? My father? Yeah. I don't know what the family did. He, he was educated in, in Russia, and he had an engineering degree, and that's what he was. He was 22 years, when he came over, he had to get out of that country and the thing. And, uh, but he knew a lot about farming, so he must have, must have done some over there. But. Uh, yeah, I'm glad he got off the boat, that's all I got to say. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I wanted to thank John for a wonderful talk tonight, and, and we really appreciate it. And, uh,